Well, John, we're going to leave this uh, this gold shirt up ah, here for at least one more week. But it'll very disappointing. Yeah, they just they got frustrated and they didn't play well. And uh, we'll have to delve into you know what went wrong. I guess we were we were hoping to talk about the Jets playing for the Robertson Cup this weekend, but lost in a sweep to the uh, Minnesota yeah. Wilderness over the weekend. So we're going to shift gears to talk about. Uh, well, the Brewers uh, doing a Playing little better, better under Craig Playing Council. better, seven and three in May. I think they are eight and three, something uh, like that. Delve into a little NFL and deflating football, deflate gate, tearing knees, overrated gate. Yeah, and uh, we got some rankings here to discuss. Your number Sir, one, Janesville Craig well, Cougars. I was going to try to tease it, but I oh, guess, okay. I guess you well, just went there with it. So. Okay, my bad. Well, it's we don't know true. what sport. Number one. You don't know what sport. <laughs> could be golf. Could be tennis. We don't know. We're we're. You're going to have to watch the show to find out which Janesville Craig team this spring season is undefeated in rank number one. That's coming up right now on Extra Points. Welcome back, everybody. Another uh, weekly version of our Extra Points show here at GazetteExtra.com or iTunes or YouTube or wherever you might be following Facebook, us from Facebook, Gazette days. Extra, whatever it is. Yeah. That was Google Plus still. I might be Chrome. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm Gazette Sports Editor Eric Schmolt. This is John Barry. We get together and at this little round table. It really is round. It is a round table, and, yes. Uh, discuss the nights of the round table. The yes. breadth of local and state sports and we might go a little national this week since there's some fun yes. NFL stuff going well, let's, on let's but, delve into tom brady um, you want to go straight there let's go straight there all right well, you, you just hey, uh, come on four what, games you don't think you should have got no. four come on i mean it's so uh, you should be able to just cheat well is he cheating or is he trying to get an edge is he trying to find an cheating. edge well but who doesn't try to find an edge i mean most guys do well whatever sport it is you try to find an edge i mean whether it was wearing sticky gloves back when fred Bolitnikov played or you know whatever the case might be but it, what he did was wrong i think he's getting in more trouble because he wouldn't turn his cell phone in i think that's more to do with it than the actual act of having a ball boy deflate some football so they're easier to grip but uh I, I was surprised. Four games, I think that'll get reduced to two. But the fine, the million dollars to Bob Kraft, that's a big deal. That's like 10 bucks to you right. and I. He probably had it in his pocket. But I think the draft picks are what's going to hurt the most. First-round and, pick, for sure. And, and let's face I mean, if— Even though it's always like a 30-second yeah, pick. Yeah, and anyway. if New England struggles, and, and it is four games, and they you know they start one and three, what if they're in the middle of the pack? All of a sudden, you take away a 15-16 pick in the first round. That's a big deal. I think they find a way to get it done. I'm not sure it's going to be reduced. I think that they— uh, I think they want to come down hard now that it's uh, kind of a dual dual committee. It's not just Roger Goodell handing it down by himself, and they're gonna, I think they're going to want to try to make a point that they're not just going to throw out arbitrary things just to reduce them like they have in the past based on appeal. Uh, it will be interesting to find out, but I don't know. I think he's getting exactly what he deserves. What I mean, if, if you catch somebody cheating, throw the book at him. Well, and I think if he'd have come out right away and said, "Look, I, you know, I'm just trying to get an edge." Uh, I like the footballs at a certain, you know, pumped up to a certain, uh, yeah, what is it, PS, PSI, PS, PSI oh, yeah, or whatever you might want to call it. And uh, I was trying to get an edge. and uh, But they it, but they put the rule out there so he can't get that edge. It's, it's a, there's a, a range that he, they, could, he could put it at the lowest end of the some, range. They did some math, and, it, and it's supposed to be at like 11.3, and his might have been down there at 11.1. So you're talking two tenths of a PSI well, or two hundredths, whatever. If that was allowed, then that, that would be part on, of the man. range. He didn't take any drugs. He didn't, you know, he didn't abuse his wife. He didn't, you know, I mean, he he deflated but I think this is, footballs. I don't, I, mean, I don't. This goes. I don't. There's been a lot of comparisons. I think this week about uh, to like the Ray Rice situation, but this is an on-field gain advantage for a championship team that has clearly tried to gain all kinds of advantages before that broke rules. And so, do you think Tom so you, Brady? You think they is, should just keep Tom Brady is the only quarterback that's ever done something like I this? I don't, but don't get caught then. Well, okay, don't get caught. He the other got guy, caught. If, if he, I mean, uh, this is the second time, big time, that the Patriots have got caught doing something pretty dumb. Yeah, spy the, yeah. the other teams aren't getting caught for all these things. So, okay, so does this does this tarnish his legacy of his four Super Bowls? I don't Bowls? think so. Nobody will. Nobody. Then will what's think. the point? I mean, isn't that what it's meant to do? And in, in the eyes of the fan, is to tarnish his no, I think his it's, image, his legacy. I think it's to put him on timeout for the first four games of the year and say, "Don't do this again." Well, time will tell. I mean, it. You know, I'm not a New England fan by any means, and I certainly could care less. But I just thought it was pretty harsh punishment 
I didn't think the punishment fit the crime. Let's put it that well, way. I think stop breaking the rules, and then you won't have to deal with All any right. sort of well, punishment. But then if you're going to nitpick about that, then like I say, you could nitpick every team and probably find something, whether it's using an iPad on the bench or signaling. You know, look at the Falcons got fined for pumping in crowd noise, you know, into the stadium. I mean, it's football. Just let them play. I mean, I don't care about if the football was a little less inflated than it's supposed to be. Well, then why should there be any rules? Why do they play with exactly. any rules then? Why have, have rules? no rules? Just go, Just go to the XFL. Just go play kill the man. That's all they XFL do. coming back <laughs> in the form of the yes. NFL. I just think there's more relevant things to worry about than that, but evidently Roger Goodell took a stand, and uh, Tom Brady's paying for it. And I, like I say, if he'd have come clean in the first place and said, yeah, I did that, but I'm just trying to get an edge, I think the punishment would have been a lot less severe. Well, you might be right there, but I think you just got to – I mean, if if you're not going to punish for rule breaking, then you shouldn't have any you rules You don't like Tom Brady or the Patriots, do you? I don't really care about Tom Brady. Oh, okay. I'm just saying. I mean, I, it's is this about Tom Brady or is this about right and wrong and, well, and I think it's the about, golden boy being tarnished? You think the NFL wanted to – you think that they were, they're glad that Tom Brady is in this situation? I don't think so. I think that with the image that the NFL took in the last year between Ray Rice and all the other domestic abuse cases, yeah, I do. I think they went after the golden boy to kind of clean up their image to say, look, we can come down on anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. And let's face it, Tom Brady's got four Super Bowl rings. He's a golden boy, and Goodell came down on him. I think the Patriots will probably find a way to just be just fine. They'll probably the start 4 Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no matter who's playing there. Exactly. Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah, or, or Michael Vick. I heard today. Kyle Orton. I heard Michael Vick's coming in today, so. Uh, you know, I think Brooks Bollinger's out there somewhere. And Chad, speaking Chad of Pennington. draft picks, you had mentioned it. Oh, no, I was uh, going to say, you know, the Patriots, they'll be just fine. But I'm not sure when you lose a number three overall pick and you're already the Jacksonville Jaguars that you're going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know if you saw the clip, but what an innocent play where he just his he planted his left leg and it it didn't give. And, well, you know, uh, you know, it's always bad when there's not any contact. Involved. No. And, and the guy that Dante he Fowler Jr. We're talking about here against uh, kind of looked at him like, you got hurt on that? What? <laughs> just yeah, I didn't do anything. I just blocked you kind of. Just to get you out of the way, but you yeah. know, a big loss for the Jaguars because let's face it, they could have taken Leonard Williams, uh, Amari Cooper. I mean, there were other guys available. They went with a speed rush guy. They haven't had double digit sacks in a hundred years, it seems like. And uh, I don't think they've they, been around for hundred. They years. were they were hoping that this was going to be the guy, and now he's out for the year. But to the Jags' credit, they said they will pay him. They will honor his contract. And uh, well, I think they would have had a pretty good fight with the players. Yeah, and I think <laughs> what'll happen is the way that, the way they can look at it is, hey, next year we get two number one draft picks. We get our own, and we get. Fowler back because he didn't play in 2015. So I guess that's the way they look at it. And Denver had a tight end from uh, Ohio State, that same injury, third yeah. round pick, and uh, he's out for the year. Oh, yeah. A little different once you get down to the lower so rounds. So, what but. I think people are curious is are they going to, is that going to change how you serve these little mini camps? Because all it is is a chance to showcase your your top draft picks. And do you reduce the contact? Do you just kind of Treat it like a walk through, like a horse fair, and just show the ponies around and, <laughs> and not have any contact. I don't know, but um, I think if you see too many injuries, something's got to happen because you can't invest that much money and that much time into somebody, and you've got him for an hour of your first practice, and then he's done for the year. Yeah. Anything else going on in the NFL that struck your interest? No, I think uh, I was, I guess, more than anything, uh, surprised that how quickly the Brady thing came down. And somebody had mentioned what would have happened if if they would have made a decision maybe before the Super Bowl. I mean, does that change anything? Doesn't it change anything? I don't know. But uh, well, hopefully think... the NFL can just steer clear now and, and just, like you said, get back to just playing football and forget all these off the field, although this was actually an on-field issue. But just get back to playing football and, and the NFL that we've come to love and and not have all these side stories that yeah. uh, there's a, I think that's become so big that we're always going to have yeah, these different yeah, crazy things going on. But we'll see as the summer rolls along. Uh, back on the baseball diamond, the about crew. the Brewers, Brew Crew. You know, I know they're, they're here's fun the to thing: watch you again. don't want to you don't want to overreact to one week of Craig Council as a manager. But right. I mean, I think, and you look at probably Monday night's game. I think as one of the clear examples where they were up. 6 nothing, and they give all the whole lead away, and then they end, wind up finding a way to bounce back and win that game. I don't know if they did that. We're doing that under Ron Reneke, and I think maybe things just kind of got watered down a little bit. And maybe I don't know that Craig Council came in there and gave him any sort of speech or really did anything to really pump them up or change everything around, but I think the change obviously sparked something in the eyes of the of the Brewers, and they've, yep. they've got some sort of 
some and they fire played, to them a little uh, bit. Four, seven, eight. They played eight games now, so they're five and three. That sound, sounds right. Five and three, and I think he said in seven of the eight games he's had a different lineup. So he's tinkering with a lineup. He had Gomez batting fourth last night, which I've said all along he should be your four hitter. Uh, Para leading off, sat Chris Davis, who's been struggling. Then he comes on and hits a home run late in the game, but. Um, I think for the Brewers right now, it's a matter of guys are producing that are getting a chance. Herrera with a big two-run homer last night. Two, uh, two home runs in like two days. The other mm-hmm. Gomez gets a home run last uh, Hector. Hector yeah. doesn't get a home run, but he's been contributing. Uh, Ramirez is still on the shelf. Um, Maldonado's been hitting fairly Maldonado's well. Maldonado's been hitting, and you're getting Lucroy back. Um, you know, you're, you're starting to get healthy again, and uh, Garza gave you a good outing. Uh, on Sunday, and uh, you know, just guys are starting to finally maybe live up a little bit to what the money that they're making. Well, and, and you saw like after those home runs uh, by Herrera and Davis on Monday night, you saw like Carlos in the dugout acting goofy yeah. and celebrating. And, yeah, and that, it just didn't seem like they had any sort of vibe like that when Ron was there. Now they didn't win any games, so that's no, <laughs> that's gonna that usually helps, hinder yeah. you from yeah. getting that kind of spark going, but. It feels like something's at least a little bit different. Well, and I think you hit it on the head when you said last night, you know, I turned it on, it was six to nothing. And, you know, an hour later, it's seven to seven. And let's face it, in the last, between the end of last season and the start of this season, that was a game they lost. Yeah. You know, the White Sox would have come back and found a way to win. The Brewers would have lost. And you'd have thought, nah, well, what else is new? But like you said, they found a way. Um, they got some good relief pitching last night. Uh, not so much from Jeffries, but. Um, you know, the back end of the bullpen, Rodriguez, again, has, has been solid all year. He's seven, seven, for seven for seven on his save. So, you know, if the starting pitching can come along and Loesch and Garza and Peralta, who was he was okay last night, and he didn't have his best stuff, but he was okay and probably should have got the win. I mean, you give a guy six runs, you should be in pretty good shape. But, um, you know, we said give him a month. And I think that's what you're going to see. By the end of June, if if their strides haven't been made, you'll probably see wholesale changes and you'll probably see a fire sale with a but lot of you, those guys. If you see the same, some, a lot of this, maybe even maybe a little not, better. Maybe with you Lucroy can back. run and make a run. I don't think they can catch the Cardinals. But Right before we came down here, I saw a tweet from Joe Block, who, of course, was uh, sitting alongside Bobby Euchre in the radio booth. Yep. And he said that the Pirates were like 10 and 21 to start the season last year and the Brewers are... 12 and 21 or somewhere this year yeah. basically in the same yep basically they're in the same boat and the pirates last year went went on to win 88 games and make the playoffs now i think that's a tough that's that's an anomaly more than it is the norm but it's not out of the realm of possibility and when you start playing like this and seeing some wins pile up a little bit more who knows and at well, least it's, it's just it's they've been fun to watch i mean yeah it's a new coach it's a new manager but they're fun to watch again, and that's that's what's going to bring people to Miller Park. And let's face it, that's the bottom line: is putting people in the seats so that you can afford to get the free agents at the end of the year, and you can afford to make trades, knowing that you got a little money freed up to try to go out and get somebody that can add either to your rotation or an everyday player in the lineup that uh, can get you over the top. Because that's all that's all the owner wants. He wants to put a good product on the field. I think he's got the money, but he's not going to be willing to spend it if nobody's going to show up to watch him play. Yeah. At least we're we're back to watching again. We exactly, were, we were getting yes. pretty close there to just never. We were. I was anymore. almost ready to burn my Brewer gear. Uh, also on the baseball diamond, number one, Janesville number one Craig, in the state. Janesville Craig. I mean, what a great story. I mean, it's. I think I was thinking about it yesterday, uh, Monday, like just going into the season. We kind of thought that Craig would be pretty good, at least have a chance to right. contend up in the t- top half of the Big Eight. But I don't think anybody expected seventeen and zero, and maybe by the time people are listening or watching this, it'll be eighteen and zero. Well, certainly uh, the paper to the north of us didn't because they picked the Cougars <laughs> what seventh in the Big Eight or eighth something. I don't like know that. if they had necessarily listed the picks, but they were like the sixth. They were the, one of the last teams mentioned. And oh, by the way, James Will Craig returns Nick Blomgren, and that's about <laughs> it. So, uh, but no, uh, kudos to the Cougars. They're playing well. Um, the top of their order is good. I mean, their first five hitters are just mashing the ball. And they've been like six and seven at this point. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's what it's going to take. Um, you know, Morrow had the scare last week with a line drive off the head, but I talked to him uh, in the dugout last week during the Parker game, said that it wasn't a concussion, and he came out and threw on Saturday, got a win against Verona. And, Evan Spry, uh, who was hurt Evan in that Spry, game, is back in business uh, again. Nyborg's been effective. Uh, sophomore Nick Kramer's been effective. And, uh, Kevin Brandt's been just hitting the cover Kevin off the Kevin Brandt is, if he's not first-team All-Big 8, uh, something is seriously wrong. 
But you could probably say that about their first five hitters because they're all mashing the ball. So it's, gonna, uh, it's it's fun to see. You just you hope the ride continues. And you talked about earlier you didn't want to talk about being undefeated. I think we can start talking about them being undefeated, at least in the regular season. After last week, uh, you know, they went through the gauntlet of not not the greatest teams maybe in the Big 8, but the the, the ones that are right there on the edge. And certainly Parker. I would say Sun I mean, Prairie's. Parker-Craig is always a, a tough game, and, and that game – the Cougars found a way. You know, once again, for the second time this year, they got behind the Vikings late and then made a push, got a couple of clutch hits, and uh, Nick Blammer came on and just slammed the door. Parker could not catch up to his fastball. And, and when he's your reliever and Craig gets a lead in late innings of a game and they've got the luxury of bringing him in, he's he's been lights out. I don't think anybody's hit him at all. And they've won close games. Right. 5-2, uh, 4-1, four, 4-2. Four, four, uh, they're finding ways to win these these close games. And to me... I think when when uh, Morrow and Spry got hurt in the same game, I was like, okay, here's here comes here's the a hurdle, yep. and maybe this is where it kind of derails a little bit. Didn't no. And now those guys are back, so that's why I don't really uh, I'm not really fearful of them falling off here. They have the game on the big game on the schedule is next week Tuesday at Sun Prairie, Sun Prairie. Yeah. Uh, the, and, the and they've scored runs. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you've got to be able to put runs on the board because you're. You can't expect your pitchers to shut everybody out, and that's what the Cougars have done. They're probably, you know, it, it seems like I don't remember them scoring any less than maybe four or five in one game. And, and if you can do that on a game by game basis, you're going to have a lot of success. Uh, Sun Prairie now, well, an honorable mention. I would say they're like twelfth in the rankings, mm-hmm. and uh, baseball wise, uh, Jefferson number three. Edgerton kind of fell out after a split with McFarland last week. And Jefferson, uh, I touched on in a, in my prep spot featured last week. Uh, they got the easiest road to state. Uh, the Mayville sectional that they're playing in is not very strong. They're the only ranked team in there. Doesn't mean there won't be a team with a, maybe a stud pitcher that would be able to face them. But with that experience and, and being there last year, uh, when you look at that sectional compared to the one that's got Edgerton, Evansville, Turner, much tougher, much tougher. Lodi, Lodi, I think, is in there, and they're always good. So it, it's going to be a much easier road to get to Grand Shoot for Jefferson than it is the other top teams from the Rock Valley. And then I thought I'd give a little shout-out. i got the uh, soccer rankings Ooh, here. And, the Elks. Uh, I bet the Elks are in there. Kind of quiet there in the uh, Division Three ranks, but uh, you know, we, don't, we don't hear a whole lot. We, we don't get necessarily all the scores reported all the time, so no, sometimes we don't. it's hard to follow, but... Uh, they've got a, quite the race going on there in the Rock Valley, and uh, McFarland is the team to beat because they only got one loss in conference. But Walworth, Bigfoot, uh, Williams Bay, the co-op up yep. there, mm-hmm. and Whitewater, and all three of those teams receiving honorable mention. And I would imagine Evansville is right on the cusp, and um, they'll be playing. Uh, they are played. I guess we would say they played Tuesday night. Yep, because. Of when this show this, airs, but. yeah, <laughs> and I and I touched on soccer in my prep spot story as well, and and Elkhorn. Uh, tied for the Lakes lead right now, I believe, and they would have to get out a Division II sectional that's going to feature Catholic Memorial, who I think is ranked number one. And I think in Division Three, uh, that goes back to baseball, Orfordville Parkview, uh, a team with two good quality left-handed starters, would have to get through a sectional of Aquinas, which was the number one team in the mm-hmm. state. So rankings are what they are. They, they mean a lot to the kids, but let's face it, come tournament time, they don't mean much. Well, yeah. I mean, for if you're Craig, it's fun to go through yeah, the halls and have your friends say you're the number one team. Mom and, and dad and grandma and grandpa can else, put it in the scrapbook and you can say it. But, you know, uh, you tell those kids, I'd much rather lose a game but win a state title than uh, get all the way undefeated and, and lose at state. So uh, rankings are great, and it's something to hang your hat on during the season. But come tournament time, everybody's 0-0. Zero and zero. Kind of the way with the Jets. Yep. I mean, they were the best team that they, they were in the NHL all year, and – Wiped away quickly in a semifinal. What you, what, what your well, quick take away from that? Well, you know, and talking series. to Joe after both games, I, I think Joe was very confident even after the loss on Friday that they would come back and play better. A lot of individual effort on Friday night just because they were frustrated because um, the style of play, the style of play, and the fact that uh, Minnesota was just content to just keep three or four guys back in the ice, which doesn't allow you a lot of rushes up the ice, and they frustrated them. 
and Joe thought they'd play better as a team, which they did on Saturday. But as good as Matt Jerusic was all year, Brock Kautz was, was their, their was, old their old pal. He was outstanding both nights. Uh, he didn't have to make a lot of great saves, but he made the saves when he had to. And I thought when Grant Hutton tied it up on Saturday night at one to one, I thought, well, James was going to find a way to win this. They'll come back Monday night and win it. And then uh, just a really Quick bad goal, defensive huh? lapse to start an overtime. They didn't clear the puck. And Minnesota stole it, and kid just a backhander that I'm not even sure Matt ever saw, and it just trickled in the back of the net, and Minnesota celebrated, and, and the Jets are kind of left wondering, wow. I mean, it, just like that, it's over. Yep, you know, and it's going to be interesting because now we, they're going to start looking to next year, and they've they've got a lot of guys going D1, a lot of guys that were taking the USHL draft or that are protected by USHL teams already. I mean, it could be a very different-looking group next year, and to try to repeat that – while trying to kind of start over, yeah. it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, and, and you know, you look at it from a, a business standpoint, and, you know, Bill's done such a great job with, with that whole organization and, and bringing that great product to town, and, and you just hope that down the road that um, people appreciate what kind of a product the Jets, you know, offer this area and, and this community, and I think kind of disappointing over the weekend that it maybe didn't get the crowd that they were hoping for. I mean, this was this was a big game and two big games and, uh, you know, nothing great. And, uh, you know, you can't tell people what to spend their money on. But you just hope that uh, maybe this year open some eyes that, uh, you know what, you want good, fun, cheap entertainment. Get yourself down to the ice arena to watch the Jets play because they, they put a great product on the, on the ice that just came up Two goals short of a, of a Robertson Cup opportunity. Yep. That should about do it, I think, this week on Extra Points. Let us know what you think. We've got uh, stuff up on YouTube and iTunes. You can find us there or Twitter or email us at sports at gazetteextra.com. Thanks to producer Andrew Ryder, Kevin McLeod for the music, and uh, we'll see if maybe the Brewers can go 5-3 Maybe again next the week we're here they'll, next be, week. they'll be one step closer to that wild card berth. <laughs> Let's let's not let's not get ahead of ourselves. No. All right. We'll see you next week, everybody. Take care, everybody. Go crew.